Welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about using EBVs, that is estimated breeding values in the beef herd. So, what are they? EBVs stands for estimated breeding values. If you're from North America, you might be familiar with EPDs, which is expected progeny differences. They're more or less the same thing. So, they're an increasingly used tool to develop beef herds as well as dairy and sheep flocks as well. We'll talk about beef here today just to try and keep it simple. It's one of those topics you could do a PhD on, you could spend a life in academia and practice and farming, researching. We're just gonna go over the fundamentals today if you're not familiar with them or you kind of half understand them. So we're just gonna scratch the surface. We're gonna do another video, hopefully next week, about using them in practice. Today, I'm just gonna go over the principles, where to find them, how to use them, and also how as vets we use them. So as I said before, estimated breeding values is what EBV stands for. It's a measure of the genetic potential for individually recorded traits. So we can use them to predict values for things like growth, carcass traits, calving ease, and more, before an individual animal has lots of progeny, or, or in this case, calves, on the ground. So it's a way of accelerating change, accelerating progress. So we're using them to help select appropriate breeding animals. Why bother? Like we said, it can accelerate change. It also helps with the traditional means of stock selection. So traditionally, beef cattle, as well as sheep and dairy cattle, are selected by eye. That is still a very valid way to do it and your eye is still the best way to assess the fundamentals of an animal. You know, is it sound? Is the locomotion good? Is it bright in the eye? Those sorts of qualities which are more difficult to measure objectively. Just consider that how an animal looks is affected by a great number of factors. So yes, genetics will be an important way of determining how an animal ends up looking. But so does nutrition, so does health status, so does the age of that animal, so does the age of its dam, and also how it's been presented. And there's only one of those things that that animal can actually pass on to its offspring, and that's its genetics. So yes, we can be looking at the most tremendous looking bull put up for sale. Just bear in mind if you're buying an animal that's been sort of quaffed and titivated, that can't be passed on to any offspring. And at the end of the day, that's why you're going out and doing this rather expensive piece of shopping. It's so you can capture some of that potential you're seeing in front of you and pass it on to your own stock. Right, so how are EBVs generated? Well, they use a combination of pedigree and production data. Those data are then plugged into something called a BLUP analysis. BLUP, B-L-U-P stands for Best Linear unbiased predictor. That's as much as I'm going to say about it for now. At some point we'll have to get one of the boffins from Signet or Breedplan on to explain exactly how that works. But think of it as an algorithm that you plug your pedigree and production data into, which then tries to distill out what is genetics and what is environment. So it's trying to remove the environmental influence from those data. Then we've got our series of traits and those tend to be more or less the same. There are some breed differences, and sometimes individual animals won't have values predicted for individuals' traits simply because there's not enough data. So we have our values, and they are assigned an accuracy value. So that is all to do with just how much data there is, the heritability of a certain trait. So heritability basically stands for how likely a trait is to be passed on to offspring. So, and some types of traits tend to be more heritable than others. For example, terminal traits, things like growth, tend to be more heritable than maternal traits. While we're talking about beef cattle, there are two organizations that coordinate the generation of these EBVs, and which one it is just depends on the breed. So in the UK, it's Signet or Breed Plan. One important aspect of EBVs is that they are breed specific. 
the traits are benchmarked against a breed average. So you can't use an EBV from an Angus to compare to an EBV of a Charolais, which you couldn't use to compare to an EBV of a Simmental, and so on and so on. The important point to note is not all breeds have EBVs generated. So you've decided you're gonna try and hunt out some EBVs. How do you find them? First of all, like we just said, check that they exist. So the breed you're looking for actually uses EBVs. Once you've determined that yes, the breed I'm talking about does use EBVs, does record this sort of data, then the way I would do it, I'll try and share this screen with you. If not, I'll work out some way of doing it. I would just go, say we're looking for an Angus, we'll just search EBV Aberdeen Angus. Lo and behold, the first one that comes up, Aberdeen Angus Herbuck online. Some breeds, you'll be shunted through the Breed Society page and they can occasionally be a bit difficult to find. If you have real issues finding it, I would just try and give the Breed Society a ring and they will likely be able to point you in the right direction. Anyway, we're talking about Anguses. So, as you can see, you come to this page and I would just go for EBV inquiry and we come to this search page. So, normally when I'm looking, I'm looking for a specific animal. Um, and all we need there is either the tag number, the full tag number, or the pedigree name. So I want to find a specific bull that one of our clients is using for AI. So I'll just plug in the name. Search. You can also find EBVs in semen catalogs, which I'm sure like me, most of you will have to hand. And I've got a cogent one here to show how I don't have favorites. Here's a genus one as well. Again, you just go, say I'm flicking through, uh, let's look at some Herefords. So here's a nice one, Hereford Matty S098. And you can see there, there is his EBV graph. So here we go, here's Melview Gordon. Here's the EBV presented as a quick table. We'll click into him. And as you can see, there's some information there about him. Uh, I hope you see his mail tag number, date of birth, um, breed and current owner. There's a few bits on DNA and genotyping here. Here's an interesting one. Um, myostatin. At some point, we'll talk about myostatin a bit more. I'll leave it for just know that in breeds that are genotyping for myostatin, you can normally find it on a page like this. Anyway, here is his pedigree, if you're into that sort of thing. And here is the EBV table. So like we said, there are a load of individual traits across the top row here. And now these numbers in the EBV row don't really mean much. Um, unless you're very familiar with them. The accuracy, as we discussed before, the accuracy is a degree of just how sure we can be that these traits are right. Uh, and again, a few bits, number of herds, so how many he's had scanned, as that'll be for things like uh, eye muscle area, fat depth, uh, just how many progeny, so progeny being his calves, he's had analyzed, and from what number of herds. So. Again, I think farmers like me, a lot of them are more visual. So you can see these presented as a graph and you just go back up here to EBV graph, click view. And we get this lovely graph. So these correlate to what you see in the table, but they benchmark them up the middle here. And that's the average again for the 2019 born calf. So it's quite a recent average. And all I'm gonna to say to you at this point is generally, right of that line, good, as in better than average, left of that line, bad, worse than average. It does get more complicated than that, but, but if this is your first time looking at EBVs, in general, you want to see more stuff right of the line than you do left. So let's go through these traits, yellow are the kind of carving traits. So I'm just gonna go into the carving ease direct and 
daughters because that can be slightly confusing initially. So the very top one, direct carving ease. That means how easy will this bull's calves be born? And that's it, that's straightforward. The carving ease daughters, sometimes also called indirect carving ease, means when this bull has heifer calves, how easy do they tend to carve down themselves? So it's almost a sort of grandsire effect. Don't assume that bulls that have a good direct carving ease also have a good indirect carving ease. Often they do, often they don't. And again, those two measures of carving ease also tend to be correlated to gestation length. The shorter a calf is cooking in pregnancy, the smaller it tends to be, and normally the more easily born it is. <clears throat> Likewise with birth weight. Then you get onto the green trait. These are the growth traits. So 200 day weight, 400 day weight, 600 day weight. Uh, another sort of weight trait, maternal cow weight. Again, possibly if you're looking to have some smaller cows, maybe you can see here that lighter uh, is on the left. You might actually be aiming for left of center if you're looking to breed some lighter cows. Milk, that's, again, that's how milky these cows will end up being. Scrotal size, why is that in? Well, in male ruminants, their, their ability to serve lots of females is directly correlated to the scrotal circumference and the fertility of their female offspring is also correlated to the size of the scrotum. So bigger scrotum, more serving capacity in bulls, generally more fertile daughters as well. Then we come into the sort of more retail carcass traits. In Britain, farmers are often paid on confirmation and size, whereas in places like Australia, the USA, they're paid on eating quality, which correlates to things like intramuscular fat. You see that IMF. Um, so again, probably more of interest if you're a finisher or even a processor. And finally, the indices, so terminal index and self-replacing index. I'll not go into them too much here. Just know that the indices represent a combination of some of those traits you see above. So you can imagine the terminal is mainly to do with growth and the carcass traits and the self-replacing index also includes more of the sort of scrotal size milk carving ease traits. So again, having said that right of the line is better than the breed average for, in this case, 2019 born calves and left of the line is below breed average, you can probably see that on this measure of the EBVs, this bull is very good indeed, very easily born. The daughters will also carve down pretty easily, nice small calves that still grow better than average, good scrotal size and uh, better than average for a lot of the carcass traits. So in some ways, this bull is what we would call a curve bender, and a curve bender can be a few different things. And what you'll often find is animals that have a good maternal sort of calving traits have poorer growth traits. That's a trade-off you quite commonly see, but not always, and when you get the best of both worlds, we call that a curve bender. So this bull, I would classify as a curve bender. If you disagree, just let me know. Again, if you're a farmer, you might be asking yourself, what on earth has this got to do with vets? Why are you wasting your time looking at these? There's two main ways we use these. Nice way is before a client buys a bull, they may well consult us and say, this is what I'm looking at. What do you think? Or they might show us a bull catalog and say, this is what's on offer. Uh, what do you think of these, this offering? And what we can do, we can sit down, we can use these traits. Again, if there's visual aids there, like photos, you can look at them as well but we can look at these traits in conjunction with that. Often what we'll do is we'll do a traffic light system. So green, very good, go for it. Amber, okay, and red, do not buy. If anything, the do not buys are the most important of the whole lot because that brings us on to the next way we as vets tend to get involved with EBVs and that's troubleshooting. So what do vets do, spend a lot of their spring doing? Carving cows. And if they're not carving cows, they're cutting them outside in a C-section or they're trying to push a uterine prolapse back in that's been pulled out because of a massive calf, or they're trying to get big slow calves going. They're looking at joint ills or navel ills because big slow calves don't get up and suck. All of these problems often related to calving ease. It's not uncommon for one or two herds during calving every year to have a real bother with hard calving. And what we do 
often it's 3 a.m. You're there doing a cesarean. You politely inquire as to the bull used and you try and wangle a tag number out of him. And then you come in, get some sleep. Next morning, you plug that tag number into your EVV inquiry. And more often than not, that bull has pretty horrendous calving figures. So you know either to get rid of him for next year or certainly to avoid putting him on any heifers, any cows you know are gonna be hard calving. That's as best a summary as I can do. We've, we've not talked about genomic EBVs, we've not talked about feed efficiency, we've not talked about the AHDB national beef evaluation EBVs. We've not talked about sheep and dairy cattle. You know, there's a huge amount to talk about, but to keep it manageable and to not completely carpet bomb you with information in one go, that's where I'll leave it. So again, summary, they're a great way to try and accelerate change. The caveats being, if we're moving at twice the speed, we need to be twice as certain of the direction. You can't use them between breeds. You can only use them within breeds. So you, you can't compare an EBV from an Angus, say, with an EBV of a Charolais. Just remember, they measure genetic potential, potential being the key word. If an animal that has tremendous genetic potential is never going to meet that potential if it's ridden with if it's ridden with disease, if it's given poor nutrition, and if it's not looked after by a decent stockman. A colleague of mine, Joe, will always say, if you feed a racehorse donkey food, it's probably not going to win many races. Likewise, if you feed a donkey racehorse food, that's probably not going to win very many races either. Just keep an eye on those accuracy values. If a bull is in the bottom 5% for calving ease with a sort of a lowish accuracy, the chances are he's going to move even to the bottom 25% or average is pretty low. Yes, they are always only as good as the information going in. Whenever I discuss this with farmers, there tends to be this worry about rogue traders, if you like. You can never rule it out in any walk of life. Thankfully, the vast majority of people are honest and there are quality assurance schemes to try and keep people on the straight and narrow. So that all comes down to the breed society, but there'll be things like independent verification, DNA testing. And what I would say is the truth always comes out in the end for those who are trying to cheat the system. So in summary, they are a great tool that's currently very underutilized in the UK for improving the beef herd. No, they aren't perfect, but nothing's perfect. And and really, there's big scope for integrating them more into breeding decisions in British beef herds. I hope that was straightforward enough. No doubt, I've been unclear somewhere and you've probably got lots of questions. If you have, by all means, put them in the comments and I'll try and answer them as best I can. Or if not, I'll try and direct you to someone who can. Thanks for watching.